Lots to talk about in the NFL world with our friend from Sports Illustrated, the man who writes the MMQB every single week, my buddy Albert Breer. How are you, Albert? I'm good. I'm good. I kind of wish I had some Thursday night fall, Rich. I, uh, yep. You know, sometimes we poke fun at it and everything else, but then they take it away from you and you kind of miss it, you know? Well, you know what, Albert? I'm I, As you know, I'm, I've am i been at the forefront of the uh, everybody bashes Thursday night football uh, until you actually watch it uh, bus. You know, I've been driving that after spending, you know, almost 10 years sitting out on the set watching Twitter blow up about how terrible the game is and then you know, a Sunday or Monday night game is three three after the first half, and nobody complains about it. You know, I've been I've been at the forefront of that pretty much. But hey, well, I'm, but I'm hey. glad you're a pioneer in that regard. Thank you so it, much, it Albert. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but we did get a Wednesday game. We did get a Wednesday game, and uh, I've got one more soundbite from Mike Tomlin to play. Um, you know, that I'm curious to 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 play for you. Uh, and uh, to get your thoughts on how the Steelers reacted to everything from the league this week. This was Mike Tomlin. Uh, if that second bat sound bite you played for me before the show, Don Bowie. Uh, here, here is what he had to say about prep preparing now for the next game. Mike, you guys have a short week to address any of, of the problems that arose in this game. Do you guys have enough time to turn things around before you play Washington hey, hey, on Monday? We, we, don't have to reinvent the, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, it, it's not some transformational thing that needs to – to, to transpire, we got to coach better and play better when we get inside a bowl. And so I expect our group to do that on Monday night or Monday evening, whenever it is that we play. Okay, so now Tomlin, uh, with that comment at the very end, you could tell um, he, he's, he's had enough of the schedule changes. Uh, how did the Steelers yeah. take this entire past week, Albert? Uh, you know, I, I think, like, you, you look at the record, Rich, <laughs> I mean, they've handled it just about as well as anybody. And remember, and, and it's easy to forget this because it feels like it was 10 years ago now, but they were the team that was on the other side of the Titan situation earlier in the year. So they had their bye week basically taken away from them too. This, you know, would have represented, um, you know, this would have represented like the mini buy, And, you know, now that's gone. And so it's just, I mean, you look at what the Steelers have been through, and you would think it'd be sort of a worn-out team. And, um, you know, I think you got to give them a lot of credit for their resilience because they've sort of been dealt a bad hand when it comes to that. They've fought through that. And, and then you look at some of the injury situations and how they've been able to find guys. I mean, you know, they lost Devin Bush, who's a, and, and you know as well as anybody how good a player he can be. Um, a, a major part of their defense. And they've been able to kind of fill in for him with guys like Rob Spillane, and now they lose Bud Dupree. And so, you know, I, I think one of the things that – and it was interesting because I talked to Spillane after the game last night, and um, he basically kind of told me what Mike Tomlin said to them uh, back in July when they reported for training camp. He called it necessary business in 2020, being able to kind of take all these things that are going to be different this year and turn them into advantages for the team. And so um, I think they've been able to do that. The record certainly shows it, you know, even in a day when they didn't have their best game. Um, and I think that they, you heard that across the board from all the Steelers who spoke after the game. They, they didn't feel like they played very well. They were still able to come out on the right end of the scoreboard as, as they have every week all year. Bud Dupree, though, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're expecting Huge to it's, 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 how, how do they How do they come back from that one? That that's that's a big one because now that means yeah. presumably T.J. Watt will get the attention that um, he has not been getting because some of it has to have been paid to Dupree all season long. Right, and you know, like that's the thing. It's like Dupree had been, you know, over the first you know four or five years of his career, I think a little inconsistent. Great athlete, right? He was really raw when he was coming out of school as a first round pick, but just a freak athlete and was really starting to come into his own. And it sucks for him personally, too, because I, I think he was really kind of set up to cash in on, on, on everything that he'd done um, over the last year or so. Um, and that's probably not going to happen, at least to the degree it was going to happen after this year. And it's a huge loss for the reasons that you mentioned there. I mean, losing him really means that if you're you know an offense now, you can put a, devote a ton of resources to taking care of T.J. Watt, who – is absolutely a defensive player of the year candidate. So not only do you lose, you know, all Dupree's production, you also kind of lose the impact that he had on, on one of the best defensive players in football. And so, you know, now they turn to a rookie, um, you know, and Alex Highsmith, who's played a bunch for them 
and made some key plays. And the guy that they really like um, is a third round pick. So it's not like the guys come out of nowhere, um, you know, but they'll be leaning on him a lot, you know, and, and, and for a defense that's play, been playing really well, asking a lot more of him. And so it'll be interesting to see how that, that plays out because it did feel after about, I feel like after about like eight or nine years of trying to rebuild coming out of that, like Troy Palomalu, uh, James Ferrier, Lamar Woodley, James Harris in that era, they've really struggled to put together, you know, a great defense again. And it really felt like they were right there. Albert Breer here on the Rich Eisen show. And in terms of the Steelers, you know, there's no like league bias towards the Steelers. I mean, if you really want to, uh, you know, if you really want to put a fine point on it, Dan Rooney was the one who knocked on Roger Goodell's door, um, you know, a hotel room door to say that the meeting had just broken and he was the new commissioner of the NFL. So, yeah. I mean, but it is just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess, that the Steelers have yeah. been on the, you know, the the wrong end, I one would say, of the scheduling stick and. And they have been undefeated through all of that. So, uh, And I will touch on this subject with CEO of the 49ers, Jed York, coming up at the top of the next hour uh, about he was his team was on the short end of a Thursday night stick with Green Bay coming to town. And they, right. were, they were highly shorthanded due to a, a late positive test that really they weren't so sure was positive at the time in Kendrick Bourne. What is, what, just for, to lay it out here, the, the, the rules – by which the NFL decides to push one game six days or a game like Denver hosting the Saints or that Thursday night Packers at 49ers, got to go. I mean, it doesn't matter how hamstrung yeah. another team has got to go. What, 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 what is this situation, yeah. best you can tell? Well, I mean, first of all, first of all, I think we're on track. I dispute this, but I think we're on track for uh, the league is scoring us accusations for a single year, right? <laughs> right. Um, so we'll probably we'll probably wind up breaking that record, but that's that's a circumstance we're all in. You know what I mean? Like, and I think um, you know at the beginning of this in July and August, I remember like the messaging that was coming out of three forty five Park, and I think some of those guys maybe wish they had said it a little louder at the time, but. Um, you know, what they were, what, what they were telling all of us was there are going to be inequities and this is going to be sideways and there's going to come a point in the year where it's not going to be fair. And we just have to accept that if there's going to be football in 2020, this is just what everybody signed up for, you know? And so I think that was sort of like the, the that, that's the message I've gotten pretty consistently. And again, this isn't revisionist history. This is going all the way back to the start in the summer. And, and really, um, you know, like to answer your question, Rich, like, the actual standard, right, is is spread of the virus contained? And they felt like the Tennessee situation, um, it wasn't contained. Um, they felt like in this situation with Baltimore, it wasn't contained. And that was proven by the fact that yep. uh, you know, the Ravens got positive tests back, like just as they were boarding their flight for Pittsburgh. And you know, they finally got to the point where they felt like it was contained and they could explain those two. But there was concern on the part of the Ravens players. You know, I can tell you, like, they felt uneasy about getting on that plane. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, really the standard here is, do, do, can the league prove that the spread of COVID-19 is contained? In Denver, if you look at, like, what happened there, really, it was one case, right? Like, so it was the case of Jeff Driscoll, and then the other three quarterbacks didn't have it, but they were close contacts. So, like, does that suck? Yeah, it sucks. That, 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 that's, that's a really tough circumstance for a team have to, to have to deal with. Is there medical risk by putting the Broncos in the field in that case? And not really, right? Like, so I think that's what you have to look at. Like, if you want to look at the league, and, I, and I'm not saying that the league's done everything right here, um, like across the board all year, but, I mean, I think they have been pretty consistent on this, that if there's a medical risk, we will look at postponing games. We will look at potentially, if it comes to that at the end of the year, canceling games. Um, but if it's about a competitive issue, we're not going to – like, that, that, that's, that's, that's not going to fly. Like, that's not going to be the reason why we postpone or cancel a game because the goal, again – is to get all 256 games played. A few more minutes left here with Albert Breer of uh, Sports Illustrated, senior NFL reporter, the MMQB, here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, what do you know about Breeze? Is this, do you think, going to be uh, the final start for Taysom Hill, or or it may last further, his uh, Breeze's absence due to his ribs? What are you hearing about? Yeah, I, I think part of it's just going to be like functionality, you know, and, and pain tolerance and those sorts of things. And I, I can't, like, 
I mean, God, if I crack one rib, right. uh, I know. Rich, I have, I, I can't sleep. You know what I mean? Like so, I, I, I like it makes my it makes me cringe thinking of what eleven crack grips feels like. Uh, so I think part of it's going to be just how functional he can be out there, and I and I don't think they're going to know ahead of time. Like I think that's the other part of it. Like, do they feel good about where he is, and that maybe he could start in a week or two? Yeah. Um, will they know until he's there? I don't think they'll really know. You know, and I think this is going to have to be a day to day thing based on the nature of that injury, and so. Um, look, the good news is uh, they've got a team that we've seen is capable of winning um, without being electric in the passing game, which, I mean, I, I think is, if you look at past Saints teams, they were so reliant on Drew Brees in that passing game. It shows you what sort of spot that roster's in. And, um, you know, to win 31-3, to even though the Broncos were in the situation they were in, um, and look at how dominant they were throwing for under 100 yards, um, I think it, it shows you really where the, the Saints are from a team standpoint. And so I think having what I believe is the most well-rounded roster in football right now gives them some leeway to be patient with Drew Brees if they want to, if they want to be. And, um, you know, really, I mean, what's the goal here? The goal is to have Drew Brees in the best possible place that you can on January 4th, the day after the regular season ends. And you're getting ready for the playoffs. And and the game Saints Falcons uh, is fascinating uh, because of what Raheem Morris has been able to do yeah. um, as the interim head coach. He and interestingly enough, uh, two big uh, division games for the interim head coaches as Romeo Crennel, just like Raheem Morris. Both teams four and three under their interim head coaches since the firings of Bill O'Brien and. Uh, Dan Quinn, respectively, do either of these guys have a shot at the at the the twenty twenty one gig? Do you think, Albert? I Romeo Cornell, I'd say no, um, and I still think Houston's figuring out a lot of things. I'll put it that way, um, and that I, I, I like I, what road they're going to go down as far as the general manager, what Jack Easterby's place in the organization is. You know, like whether or not like. Is it possible like like he could be gone? Like there's just I think there's a lot of unanswered questions in Houston, and I just I have a hard time seeing where they wouldn't you know uh, they wouldn't be resetting at the very least at the head coach and general manager positions. Um, as for Atlanta, I do think Raheem Morris has a really has a, has a very real chance there. He's got a relationship building. Rich McKay's of course worked with him. They both have ties back to Tampa. Yep. Um, and I and I think you have to kind of like rewind back to the beginning of this year, and you know I I make calls on these sorts of things over the summer, and um, you know I, Raheem Morris is one of those names who like all right like this guy's ready for his second chance, and a lot of the reasons why people liked him ten years ago they're still there, and he's grown up a lot, and like the people in the Atlanta building really respond to him, and this is the second year in a row now we've seen this sort of response. Remember last year when he was elevated to defensive coordinator, the Falcons caught fire. And now you elevate him to head coach, and they've caught fire again. And so I think, you know, a lot of the reasons why people saw him as a potential head coaching candidate back in the summer, those are still there. And now he's bolstering his case with how the team's playing here um, down the stretch. He's still really young. And, you know, I, 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 I really think that this is a guy who could wind up being a, a really, really good find for somebody in his second shot as head coach. And it's something I think the Falcons have to consider now. Um, you know, you look at like Anthony Lynn, when, you know, uh, the Bills fired Rex Ryan a few years back, how Anthony Lynn really kind of showed who he was and wound up earning the Chargers job off of what he had done as, a, as an interim coach um, with the Bills. Like, I think we're seeing the same sort of thing with Raheem. And maybe it's enough where, where he doesn't have to move and, and the Falcons wind up naming him the head coach. I'm not saying that's, absolutely going to happen but i think it's at least now in play i mean if if um todd Gurley had not accidentally scored you know i mean they they'd be they'd be five, five and two and one with him yeah. right, right or yeah. five and one that's right they're five and one with him i mean very very impressive uh what's going on right there before i let you go um have you used any of your resources to inquire whether the big 10 will in fact change its rules uh, about how many games a team has to play in order to be eligible to win the conference championship with what's going on with your your Buckeyes, is that possible? Well, Do you think you know, that's possible? Well, well, as you know, Rich, I'm I'm about the collective, right? Like I'm really about what the collective good of the Big Ten conference. No, I know you, you are. Know, like that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. And I, I like is it so good for I, the conference? If is, is it good for the conference if you're hurting the college football playoff chance chances of the conference? 
Well, I mean, I what's the point? In, in all conference, honesty, right? Albert. For the conference. In all honesty, Albert, what is the point of having gone through the season? If the season, um, the way that it has gone, let's be honest here, did give credence to those who are like, why are we playing at all? But you right, have right. actually endeavored to play. Why have a rule that is in place that clearly doesn't affect anything at all? I mean, I, I, I think the rule was probably in place that if – Everybody was playing, you know, like if one team was 6-0 and and another team was 2-0, and then that team that's 2-0, and no matter how many star recruit athletes they have, they shouldn't have a chance to, you know, uh, derail the 6-0 and team. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I understand why having the rule in place, but the way that things have gone, there is no reason to, you know, uh, what's the word for it? Kneecap, poleaxe, Ohio State's chances – uh, of going yeah. somewhere because of everything that's gone on with the virus. There's no so. Do you think I know Al, Barry Alvarez actually that, said something about it yesterday, saying we should talk about changing the rule. Do you think that can actually happen? Yeah, yeah, I do, and I and I think it's like, and I think it's just you know, like look, like I don't think we can, I don't think we can look at rules that we, but uh, like in every sport, like rules that we basically all made up on the fly, right? right. Like so, like these aren't rules that have been in place for thirty years. No, you made it up that you had to play made... six games in this in this pandemic. You had to play at least six <laughs> right. games in this you pandemic made up the rule to be based on what you knew in September. And so, is it that crazy to make up a rule to to change a rule now no. based on what you know in December? No, and I and I do think like one of the things that's that's key here is the head to head too. You know, I mean, like like how. How would you look at Indiana? Like, is that a legitimate Big Ten championship? If Indiana winds up, say Ohio State, like, say the college football playoff puts them in, and, you know, Ohio State wins the national championship, right? And they do it after playing in the second place game in the Big Ten. So they play against Wisconsin that, that, that championship weekend. Like, does anyone remember Indiana as the real Big Ten champion then? No. Like, you know, like, so – I mean, I, I think Tom Allen and those guys have done a great job at Indiana. They deserve a ton of credit. But, but they didn't beat Ohio State, they though. Lost, they didn't beat they Ohio lost, State. But they lost the head-to-head. And that game, right. if you watch that game, like to some like the, the, Indiana showed great heart. Ohio State went up 35-7 to and fell asleep. You know what I mean? Like so. No, I know, I just, Albert. I don't know. That's what I'm and saying. Look, part of me, you're yeah, right. Yeah. You can change the rule. I think that the, the NCAA or the FBS writ large should – should change everything. Like it's like why yeah. are we why are we sitting here watching BYU schedule Coastal Carolina so both sides can beef up their resumes when we could just expand the playoffs and let everyone play and not cross vectors nationally and until I, when I, it's all on the line. Like what what are we so doing? Is essentially that to me, what I'm saying. Rich, thank you, thank you. What are we like, doing? That to me, like like that to me is so perfect. Like like wouldn't this be like. If you were the college football playoff, wouldn't this be the perfect year to just float the trial balloon of the 18 playoff and see how it works? Like, yeah, right. Why not? Right. Like baseball like expanded their playoffs. That, right. Exactly. Right. Just, I mean, like you, and you know what? You get a free look at what it looks exactly. like too. Right. Right. Like so, so you can go back to four teams next year, or maybe it works so well that you want to go to eight teams permanently. Right. Like I, like they had, a, they, they have like a free shot at potentially going to eight teams here or even 16, if you really want to get crazy about it. Like, but like either way, like you have this free shot at it. There's like a logical reason to do it. I'm with you a hundred percent. Throw Florida in there, throw Texas A&M in right. there, I mean, what throw we BYU in there, throw Cincinnati in there. And like, I, I just think it would be Let's so much go. fun to have that sort of thing. And I, I, I can't imagine any school would be against that. Um, and like, look, like if it really works and if it's, you know, something like if it's something that you were thinking about anyway, which I think that they have thought about expanding the playoffs. Why not in this weird, different environment? Why not just take a shot at it? And right. if it works, great. If not, you go back to four teams and, you know, nobody's worse for the wear. I know we're up against it in the radio business, and I apologize to our radio partners for going a little bit longer with Albert Breer here. But while I am being reasonable and have shown my uh, reasonableness by pounding the table for Ohio State and the Big Ten, um, can, can we all agree it's insane to suggest Michigan is ducking Ohio State using COVID as a shield? Yeah. And maybe to try and I kneecap your chances? I, I had some, can, we, can we agree I had on some that? Fun with that. I, I had some fun with that. But you know what? Like, what Come I know on. about Jim Harbaugh, Please. Um, what I know about Jim Harbaugh having covered him when he was in San Francisco, um, I Please. don't think that's really in his personality to do that. Come on. I mean, it's. <laughs> like, I, I, I just. Like, if, like he's he's a, he's a, he, as you know as well as anyone, Rich. He's a different dude. Like, 
Shocking right. people is not in his personality. Yes, in his and, personality by saying don't eat chicken because it's a nervous bird. Yes, that's there. But ducking, ducking is uh, is that's okay. I'm glad I'm glad we can at least agree on that in part. And, and yeah, go with I our mean, I had ways. some fun with it earlier in the week, but mm-hmm. like I, you know, and, and that, look, I, I I think it's kind of a funny idea, but like there's no, I like I don't think those kids would want to duck Ohio State, and I certainly don't think that coach would want to. I mean, I remember watching him coach in 2014 i the building was like on fire in san francisco right like that thing was i mean that was not a good situation and you know what like that team kept swinging till the end and you had to get that was, this was the one thing at the end of all of that like that anybody no matter what you thought of jim like you had to give him credit like that team kept swinging all the way to the end so i can't imagine that like he would be concocting some plan to try and duck ohio state or try to screw them out of the playoffs. It just doesn't seem like that's in his personality. Yeah, all. and using COVID as that cudgel as well. Um, Albert, thank you for the call. Appreciate it. You take care. I'll read your stuff on Monday as always, and let's uh, let's stay in touch. We'll have you back on. Awesome, awesome. Stay safe out there, all right, guys? Right back at you. That's Albert Brewer here on the Rich Eisen Show. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here. 